this I see Just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever This will be my posture Laying at your feet Oh, just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever
while you remain in his presence, I want you to lift your hands up. And I want the praise team to just sing that song a couple more times real softly. And I want you to focus on him. Focus on his presence. And focus on the beauty of holiness. You are God alone. Sing along with the praise team as you just softly worship him. You are God from beginning. we love you this morning do you love him this morning thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart thy mind thy soul thy strength everything that is within you Lord we love you this morning amen and we praise your name for all of your goodness be thou glorified this morning and as always be glorified in our lives Lord thank you Jesus blessed be the name of the Lord in Jesus name and somebody said amen, amen. put your hands together for the Lord Jesus hallelujah amen you may be seated good morning thank you uh, praise team you all may be seated praise the Lord hallelujah amen we're coming to you Live from beautiful Phoenix, Arizona, and this is GMI Church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Have you been enjoying the Lord? Hello? Have you been enjoying the Lord? Praise God. All right. Well, you know, the... Um, We've been uh, doing uh, this series on the transformation series and all. And uh, there's one more part that I'm going to do today. And maybe after that, we'll take a break from that. I think I've kind of covered most of the things I want to cover for now until the Lord brings something else to my mind. But today is part of it. But before I release the title of today's message, let me talk about what we have been discussing. How from the beginning what God had in mind and how Adam fell through disobedience. And how because of the disobedience of one man, death passed unto all and we all fell from his glory. But in the mind of God, <laughs> see, Whatever God had in mind, the Bible says his counsel shall stand. Amen. Amen. So his original counsel was for the sons of God to be conformed to the image of Christ. That was his original counsel. And even though we fell, you know, because of Adam and all of that, at least one man began, you know, after he heard all the stories of Adam, Enoch, he began to pursue the Lord. Until finally he got into a realm where he walked with God. And he was not because God took him. He attained unto that place and he went. And from then on, you know, men began to call upon the name of the Lord and so forth. You know, and here we are today. Transformation series, part four. The new creation, the sons of God. Amen. You know, so 
One time we talked about, you know, God having different kinds of sons. Of course, his original son, the Christ, you know, who was with him from the beginning. And then the created son who was Adam in Luke 3.38. And then the adopted sons who are coming into sonship. You know, now, repetition is the law of long and lasting impression. You say, why do you keep saying this thing? Because that's what the Lord wants me to say, so that it can stick with us. Now, today we're going to talk about the new creation. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, this was a scripture that I learned many years ago that actually led me to Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. Well, I think that scripture is there. And it's in the mind of God that that's the way it should be. But it isn't exactly quite like that yet. For most people that are giving their lives to Christ. And the reason is, because when they gave their life to Christ, some of them were just, well, give your life to Christ, is what they were told. And they give their life to Christ. And I don't know what, what, what does it really mean, you know, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But I want to talk about, we've been talking about a process. But there's also, there's a process. I want to read John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 12. He said, you know, but as many as received Christ... To them, he gave power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. So there is a process of becoming. It's not just, you know, it's not just believe, you know, believe on the Lord. You will be saved, quite all right, but you don't get fully into that sonship. See, and we are going to talk about that and then see the reason why it was all meant to be that way. Because we are the end time generation. Amen. That means we are the generation that ends time. <laughs> end time generation. Generation that ends time. You know, this is it, folks. And we are coming to that climax. From beginning, God said in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Let us make man. I explained that last time. In our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion. So the sons of God are coming into that dominion. Amen. Amen. And we talked about it last time that look first. These two prerequisites. They must be in his image. And after his likeness. In order to come into that dominion. So we talked about that. Now. But we are going to go a little further today. Because there has been so much talk of the manifestation of the sons of God. In fact, you Google that topic on the internet, you will see it all over the place. And what exactly is it? You know, I mean, why do they need to be manifested? What is, what's, what is that? What's such a thing is that? You know, so there is a creation, a new creation. Also in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are told that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Unto good works, with God ordained that we should walk in there. It's kind of like, it's almost like we're created again. You know, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. <clears throat> And verse 18. I mean, sorry, not verse. Chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. I want to uh, quickly go through this. The word of the Lord from verse 1, which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and I will cause thee to hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house. And behold, the potter, he wrought a work on the wheels. 
So Jeremiah went down to the porter's house to see what the porter was doing. And the porter, he wrought a walk on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred, like messed up, in his hand, in the hand of the porter. So he made it again unto another vessel, as it seemed good to the porter to make it. Amen. Amen. You know, so I preached a message some years ago called Holy Ghost Make Over. You know, now, but this one is beyond, you know, just, uh, you know, the makeover that you think of when you do your face and women and stuff like that. You know, now, what do we see here? The potter made a vessel, but somehow the vessel got messed up. And the Lord said unto uh, Jeremiah, saying in verse 6, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as with this potter? You know, as the clay is in my hand and so forth like that. So, you know, now, we know here he was talking about Israel, but, you know, let's take it a little further. See? God made man. And he put him there and gave him commandment, instructions, and so forth. But somehow, you know, that whole thing got messed up, you know. And so, there is a new thing eh, that God is doing. The first Adam, he couldn't do it. So, he had to bring the second Adam up, you know. And now, we are in his lineage. But there's a process. The process is how do we become. And we read this last time in Galatians chapter 4. Verse 19, where Paul said that my little children in whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. That's Galatians 4 and verse 19. Now, so there is a process of Christ being formed in us. But if Christ is to be formed in us, and if we are going to become quite like him, what is it all about? I mean, what is the purpose? Now, I want to say something about this process. Let's go back to this same Galatians chapter 4, but let's pick it up from verse 1. From verse 1, we're going to see a depiction, you know. He said, look, when somebody is born into like a kingdom and he's the heir, you know, and he's supposed to inherit everything, you know, but when he's a baby, he's no different than a servant. Hello? <laughs> That's what he says right here. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a servant, even though he's Lord of all. But he's, let's keep reading. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Next verse. Even so we, when we were children, trying to grow up and so forth, <laughs> we were under bondage of the elements of this world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman under the law and he did something specific to redeem us who are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Amen. Amen. So this is the process. Even though we, you know, it was inherent for us to be sons of God, but being children or being a child, born as a child and so forth, it's no different than a servant. I mean, the, the baby that's born into the kingdom and is if you know, son of the, of the king. Maybe they call him prince or whatever. But he doesn't even know that he's a prince because he's just a baby. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, and for many years, he probably doesn't know anything. You know, but, you know, the father will hire tutors and instructors. I mean, if they're a kingdom that's used to battle and so forth, he will hire, you know, martial artists or whoever to train him how to battle and all that. In the meantime, he starts to learn that he's actually the prince. And it takes him a while for him to figure that out. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We have been like children. It's now time for us to grow up. It's time for us to grow into the image and the likeness of Christ. It's now time for us to come into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be babies. You know, if you have a baby and they remain baby forever, I don't think you're going to be too happy about that. <laughs> You need to grow up. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, this is what, this is the story. This is what's been going on. This is what uh, Christ is trying to, I mean, God is trying to do in us 
in forming us into that place that we need to be. But there's a few, there's a lot more I want to say in, in today's sermon. Just hold on. Let's go to, um, now I want to remind us that and I keep going back to this, Romans 3 and 23. The glory of God is where people fell from. And that's where God is taking us back. But in Romans chapter 8, I want to go to Romans chapter 8 real quickly. Let's read from verse 28. In Romans chapter 8, I alluded to this in one of the series earlier, where it says, look, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Amen? Amen. Not to the ones that God loves, but to them that love God. There's a big difference. I think I spoke about that in series part two or whatever. You know, the one that love God, the ones that love God are the ones that are pursuing thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. And Jesus said, I will love him. My father and I will love him. And we will come and make our abode with him. Amen. That's right, you know. Now, this is, you know, it, turns, it, it now turns around. It's almost like God is now pursuing the one. Instead of the person pursuing God, God is actually now the one pursuing. I will come after him. You know, I'm going to make my mind. Jesus said, look, Revelation 3.20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And people use this verse to preach to unbelievers. It's not a message for unbelievers. Jesus is standing outside his own church. He's outside. Because the church is doing all kinds of things other than what, you know, letting Christ in. This message was to the churches. And Jesus said, look, I stand at the door and knock. See? If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and so forth like that. So God is actually, and we're told in John chapter 4 and 24, God is seeking those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, God is a spirit. And he's, so, you know, these are the people. You, you read the next few verses. These are the people that God is looking for. So God is looking. You see, God is waiting. And there's one thing I want to go back to that I spoke about last time. This was in Matthew chapter 3. All of this is a preamble to bring us to where I'm really going with this message. Matthew chapter 3. When Jesus went and be baptized, to be baptized in the uh, water with John the Baptist. And as he was coming out, you all know what happened and so forth. You know, verse 17 says, A voice from heaven came and said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And I want to dwell, you know, I, I alluded to that a little bit last week, but I want to dwell more on that. You know, what was the reason, why was God pleased with Christ? Who hadn't, at this time, done any miracles? Hadn't done anything. He hadn't even begun his ministry. It was after this, he went to the wilderness to be tested of the devil for 40 days. And then when he came back, he went into the temple and picked up the book of Isaiah and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then he went to his ministry. So he hadn't even done all that. Yet God said, this is my beloved son. Let me tell you, here's what it is. You know, when a father has a son, and they look like him. If the son looks like the father, I mean, when the son begins to grow up, he even looks more like the father, he begins to talk like the father, he begins to act like the father. You know, the father takes some kind of pride. I'm talking naturally now. Just like pride. I said, wow, now that's my boy. Hallelujah. Amen. Now that's my boy. You know, it, it doesn't, it's not because the boy has done anything, but because he looks like the father. You know, he's talking and acting and walking and maybe he's even resembling the guy. And the guy is so happy, he's so proud, you know. The Lord was looking at the Christ and saw his express image in him. We read that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 last time. You know, that Christ being the express image of his person, the brightness of his glory. So God saw himself fully in that and he was pleased. Hallelujah. And that's what God is looking for in the sons of God. Yeah. We talked about this last time, you know. But I want to take it a little step further. Because when we're talking about this manifestation of the sons of God, now remember I said it's a new creation, the sons of God, you know. 
A lot of people, and I've said this before, are looking for the miracles that the sons of God will do, how they will have power. Well, they may have some authority and so forth, but unless they really come into that image and the likeness of God, they won't have dominion. Because dominion is do as you please. Now, but what is the purpose that they should be able to do that? You know, so... Romans chapter 8, back to verse 28. He said, whom, you know, I mean, we read that. Now go to verse 29, you know. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, in his, in his mind, when God foreknew that the sons of God would come, he already predestinated their end. You know, that's predestination. Predestination is not, you know, you'll be saved, I'll be saved. No. The predestination is these ones will become like the Christ. You know, that's what he predestinated. He predestinated them to be conformed to the image of the Christ. They will be exactly like the Christ. You know. So that he might be first. Not the only one. But he might be the first among many brethren. See, this is it. And those that he predestinated to be conformed to his image of his son, them he also called. And he called them by the gospel. Next verse. And when he called them, he also justified them. See, we are justified by the resurrection of Christ. Amen. And when he had justified them, he also glorified them. Amen. Now Jesus praying in John chapter 17 said, Father, I pray that the glory that I had with you in the beginning, you know, I have given unto them that they may be one. Now, remember, in Isaiah 42 and verse 8, the Lord said, I will share my glory with nobody. So I'm going to digress a little bit here and talk about his glory. You know, I will share my glory with nobody. Isaiah 42 and verse 8. Yet Jesus saying, the glory that I had with you in the beginning, I have given unto them. You know. Now, he said, I will not share my glory. But Jesus comes around and says, yeah, I want them to have that glory. But there is a purpose to it. Hallelujah. That they may be one. Even as you and I are one. You know, the glory. So let me digress a little bit and talk about the glory. Because this is the place from which Adam fell. Romans 3 and 23. All are falling short of the glory of God. Now there are two aspects to glory. There is a glory that defines, you know, <laughs> the encapsulation of beauty, the magnificence of beauty that you can't even describe. Hallelujah. <laughs> When you want to talk about the glory and the essence of God it, at that level, there's no word to describe. You know, there's a song that says, you know, there's only one word that comes to mind. You know, there's only one word to say. You know, they, you know and it just says holy. You know, in the book of Isaiah chapter 6. I want you to read this with me. Isaiah chapter 6 from the, uh, the first six verses or so. In this story... Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And the next thing he saw, above it he saw seraphims that had wings and all these things and so forth. Then verse 3. In verse 3 he said, one of them cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy. Hallelujah. Is the Lord of hosts. Now, the earth is full, the whole earth is full of what? Glory. His glory. Now, so they're talking about holy. So naturally, when I read this verse like this, I'm expecting that the next thing they will say to say that the whole earth is full of his holiness. Because that's what they're talking about. Holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his holiness. Holiness. But they didn't say exactly that way. They said the whole earth is full of his glory. Now that means his glory cannot be separated from his holiness. 
The glory of God is the very essence of God. Glory is not just a part of God, folks. <laughs> it is, I mean, you know, we have, this, we have this song in Yoruba that says, God takes glory from glory to glory. He emanates, you know. I mean, it, it just, you just, can't, I can't say, you know. I can't, I can't do justice to that song in any language other than the Yoruba language. But I can't sing it because many of you would not understand it. But here is how it goes. He said, you know, Obatogbe ogo, Latino ogo, Losino ogo. You know, what that means is this. You know, God takes, I mean, he redefines glory. The very essence of God redefines glory. Now, we use some words for God like he's the greatest. And he's higher than the highest. Well, that's the best of what we can imagine of God. But God can never be measured. Even if you say he's greater than the greatest, he's still greater than that greater than the greatest. If you say he's the holiest, he's still holier than that holiest. He can never be measured. That is the, that is the very glory of God. So when you're talking about the glory from which they fell, that's what they lost. That's what we all lost. Because when God breathed into the man and became a living soul, he gave him the full package. And the glory that was emanating from him made all the animals to be in subjection. But because of disobedience, we lost that glory. So for us to come back to that glory, in the book of Psalm 8, he says, look, what are thou, you know, what is man, O Lord, that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast given him dominion over all thy works. Well, I don't see him having dominion over all his works. Do you? <laughs> but that is the plan, folks. And that's where we must come into. But to get there, what is the reason why we want to get there? Some folks say, well, the manifestation of the sons of God is what God promised. And the sons of God will have power over the elements. That's good. The sons of God will have power to raise the dead. That's good. Well, they did that. The apostles even did that. Did you know that? How many of you know that the apostles raised the dead? They did all that. Including Judas Iscariot. He went out, walked miracles with them, two by two evangelism. Judas was part of them. And they greed all kinds of things. And when they came back, Judas was one of them that came back and said, Lord, all the, the and God, he discerned all of that. Jesus discerned, see their discernment, you know, and Jesus discerned all that stuff and he knew that one among them was a devil. And that's why he brought that out and said, look, it's not because the devils are jumping, it's because your names are written in heaven. But not all of their names were written in heaven. One of them was not written in heaven. Because he was so going to be the one to betray the Christ. Have I not chosen 12 of you and one of you is a devil? <laughs> you know. So walking miracles, doing all of these things, which Judas himself did, didn't prove anything. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know. So that's not it. It's got to be more than that, folks. 